The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this morning's uh, uh, webinar from Smart Vision. Um, today, we're talking about SPSS statistics. And this webinar is called Step Beyond Spreadsheets. We're really talking about how the SPSS statistics application can be used and take you beyond the sorts of analyses that one would do with traditional spreadsheet applications like Excel. Um, my name is Charles Quinn. I'm an analytics consultant, and I'm joined online today by my colleague Rachel. Rachel will be making sure that everybody's logged in correctly and fielding questions as we're going along. Um, if you haven't joined any of these sessions in the past, then if we tend to we tend to run uh, two or three a month, um, and there are certain standard sorts of uh, uh, things that we do on the session. First of all, we record them all. Secondly, we send out a copy of the slides. There isn't a huge number of slides that we use, but we'll send out a PDF copy to you after the session has ended. If you think it's particularly useful for people who, who you work with, or for colleagues who aren't able to attend today, then it might be possible for us to uh, arrange a private session, in which case just drop us an email afterwards. With regard to asking questions, well, unfortunately, all the lines are muted, so we ask you to use the chat facility, and if there's any questions that we can't answer or we run out of time, we'll obviously follow up with you offline afterwards. If you don't know who Smart Vision are, we are a premier IBM business partner specializing in the advanced analytics suite within IBM, which is the SPSS brand. But we're also a partner to SAS. And we're also a partner to uh, Blue Sky Statistics, who provide an analytical tool based on the R package. Uh, it's a sort of entry-level analytical tool. So that means that we provide software and services in the analytics industry. Um, we are made up of a veteran team of people who have at least 15 to 25 years' experience working within advanced and predictive analytics. So some of us have worked for Blue Sky, some of us work for IBM, for SPSS, and for SAS in the past. So we're all a bunch of analytics people, and uh, we're fairly familiar with the analytics landscape, and certainly something like SPSS statistics, very, very uh, widely used statistical application, an analytical application across the world in many, many different applications in many different se sectors. That's something that we've been using for in my case, for about 30 years. So today, we're going to be really introducing you to statistics, if you're not very familiar with SPSS statistics, and taking you through a demo. And we're looking at how we get data into the, into the package, and how we format the data, how we get it in shape so that we can do analysis properly. And then we're going to be looking at manipulating the data. So that'll be things like creating filters, or grouped or banded fields and we're going to be looking at analytics. In particular, we're going to look at the SPSS tables functionality, which is a module. I'll explain what we mean by a module within SPSS statistics. And we'll also take a quick look at significance testing within this application, how we can find statistically significant differences in groups. So if you're not completely familiar with statistics, SPSS statistics, you've never seen it before, you have seen it before, but you haven't seen it in a long time, and you want a refresher, this is probably a good start point for that. You should be aware that on our website, we've actually got a lot of video content and content from previous web sessions that we've run like this, where we've demonstrated other applications using other software, sometimes using statistics, sometimes using other IBM or SaaS software. So you can feel free to look on that site and look at the resources page on there, and there'll be a bunch of different videos. So first of all, let's talk about statistics, IBM SPSS statistics. So statistics, SPSS statistics, is one of the world's most popular data analysis and statistical analysis uh, platforms, and it's been around since 1968. It's very difficult to talk about a typical usage of the software since it's used everywhere from epidemiology to survey research, business reporting, and asset management, engineering, direct marketing, credit risk predictive modeling, anywhere where data is really, um, you'll often find a copy of SPSS statistics knocking around. And 
in the basic package, there's quite a lot of analytical functionality and quite a lot of data manipulation and graphical functionality. But in the base package, you would expect to see things like lots of descriptive statistics procedures like cross tabs and tab tables like frequency tables, summary tables, descriptive statistics, as well as lots of different analytical tests, statistical tests like t-test or chi-square or ANOVA, correlation values and some what we call multivariate procedures such as predict, predicting numerical outcomes using linear regression or identifying groups through factor analysis and uh, cluster analysis, that type of stuff. So there's a whole bunch of different procedures just within the base, but uh, that being said, um, SPSS statistics, SPSS base actually has a number of add-on or bolt-on uh, applications and additional functionality that simply reflects the fact that, you know, there isn't really a typical user these days. Lots of people are using it for different things. So, for example, if you're working in um, pharmaceuticals, you might be using the advanced statistics procedure to, to, um, uh, to co construct and analyze complex experimental outcomes. Um, if you're working within econometrics, you might be using the forecasting. Uh, module to look at time series analysis. If you're working within marketing, you might be using the decision trees or the direct marketing application. If you're working within central government, you might be looking at uh, complex sampling and missing values analysis and so on and so on. So there's lots of these different modules. Again, if you go on to our website, you'll find that if you, you can look up each of these modules in turn, and we've got a little, a little video for each one of them which will explain and give you an overview of what they do. Each video will last less than three minutes, so it's not very long, so it's, it's a very quick and sh short video that explains what these are. We're not going to go into the details of all these different modules. If anything, we'll introduce you to one. We'll, we'll talk about the tables module, which is one of the um, most commonly used, one of the most popular of these add-on or bolt-on modules or options within SPSS base. And the tables module, if you have it, will appear simply as an extra item in the uh, in the uh, uh, the summarize menu in the analysis menu and um, it appears as a dialog box and it allows you to build as you would guess from from the title tables and, and, and quite quite rich functionally rich uh, tabulation where you can you know highly highly customized to um, to the procedures that you want to present. Uh, and, and the analysis you want to do. So it's a single dialog box for all sorts of different tabulation, all sorts of dis different descriptive statistics, all sorts of different percentaging and summarized analysis that one might want to, to, to do. Very typical to what one might do, I guess, in, let's say, a management information platform or BI platform, except here we're working against flat files. And there's a, there's a, a very strong emphasis upon the presentation and upon statistical testing within the table, for example. So that's what the tables module does. Why do people have it? They have it because if they don't have that, if they don't have that tables module and they want to produce you know, highly, uh, quite complicated tables with lots of different fields within, in them and a particular sort of um, look to the table with different dimensions, uh, subgroups within it, then using the standard SPSS output, they'd need to really, they'd really need, need to copy and paste the standard SPSS output into something like a spreadsheet and build it up solely. So the people who are who are interested in using tables are people who are interested in you know, producing tabulation reports that are for a particular audience that are used to seeing reports in this format. Okay, so that's the tables module. Um, we'll have a little look at it later on, but suffice to say, you know, when you produce a table, you have lots of different ways in which you can present that and change the aesthetic properties of it. And this is true for all SPSS outputs. So the SPSS output that you see when you first run the system, <coughs> that's just the default output. You know, so it's, you can change the look of it, and there's almost an infinite amount of uh, different permutations one can use to change the appearance of the tables. We'll see again an example of that later on. <clears throat> if we were to focus on the three main areas that people who are good users of SPSS statistics, where they're able to demonstrate skills, 
This isn't necessarily true of SPSS statistics. This is true of any analytical platform. Pretty much any sort of data analyst who is worth their salt is able to do three things. They're able to read different formats, different data in different formats, whether it be an Excel file or a worksheet or from a database or they know how to read a, a CSV file or a text file. They know how to get that data into their platform of choice and they know how to format it so that they get the best out of it. And you don't know what I mean by format. We'll explain what we mean in a, in a few more in a few more moments. But they also know how to transform and manipulate data so they know how to compute the ratio of one field to the next. They know how to create age group from age. They know how to manipulate date fields so they can compute the, the length of time between two dates. They know how to filter out rows of data that they're not interested in. So all of these are key aspects of getting the best out of the data to do your analysis. And the third area is the analysis and deployment of results, which is that they know which analytical procedure to run in order to find out the thing they're trying to find out, and they know how to deploy the results, whether that be in the form of predictions that they're making or classifications, or just be in the form of a report, such as punching things out in the PDF format or in PowerPoint or Word or Excel again. So these three key areas are what we would normally cover on an introductory course because, you know, in order to make good use of the software, you really got to have some sort of understanding of what you can do in these three areas. And the more understanding you have of these three areas, uh, the greater your mastery of the software and of the technology. So let's have a quick look at an example. If I, if I just alt-tab out to SPSS statistics, this is the latest version of SPSS statistics, which is uh, it's version uh, 24, IBM SPSS statistics, version 24. And what people see when they open this up is <coughs> they see what looks like a spreadsheet like format. And I think that that's quite, that's quite troublesome because if you start thinking of it as a spreadsheet, it will it won't be a very satisfactory tool to use because it works in a completely different way than a spreadsheet works. Um, this is really what we call a data editor window. It's simply there to show you the data. You can edit it, but certainly one wouldn't create tables and you know draw boxes around cells in here and do calculations across the top the way one would in a spreadsheet. Okay, this is very much a case for us to read a uh, to read a file in and display it. You can read more than one file. I've got it set up at the moment here so that it reads one file at a time, so that it makes it easier for the audience and they don't get confused over lots of different files I'm reading. But if I want to read in a file, as one would expect, it is a standard Windows software. After all, one would go to the File menu here and go to Open. If I go to Open Data, you can see when I click on Open Data, it's looking for files of type called SAV or .zsav, which is a compressed version of the SAV. These are the SPSS statistics native files. So these are the these are its own file types. But obviously, when I double when I look down here, I can actually read lots of other file types. Or alternatively, I can go to File, Import Data, import data from a database or from Excel. So, for example, here if I look at a database and get data, and if I just go File, Database, New Query, I'm connected to a database here. Um, you can add a new database source by clicking on ODBC source, but I've got connected to a database here, it's a SQL Server database. And it's got lots and lots of different uh, tables within it and lots of different um, schemas, if you like. And I could simply pick up one of these uh, tables, so I could say, okay, let's look at B2B IT products. And I can look at, you know, um, product categories or retention scoring or so on and so on. And I can connect them all through. I can look at transaction history here. If I hit next, you can see it's joining them together for me because they're in two separate tables. They're actually, one is the transaction, one is the products. Hit next. It starts to read that data set down. It tells me what fields it's going to read and what type of field they're going to be. It offers me the opportunity to save that as an SQL query, a language that the database understands. And it reads the data in for me. So it's saying run and get data at the moment. You can see an output window is opened here in the background. And the output window is simply giving me a little report or any warnings. So it's just telling me that it's going to be renamed. And uh, that's, that's what a data set looks like in 
in SPSS statistics. If I didn't want to read that data set, but instead wanted to read an Excel file, then I could go to File, Open Excel, or CSV. And here I've got one here called Employee Workbook. WXLS. This is one we'll use for this session. If I open that, just give it a second to parse that. It gives me a little preview of the file. And it tells me how it's going to read it. It's going to start in cell A1 and go down to cell J476. So we can see it looks like it's reading the field names across the top. It's going to ignore any hidden rows and columns. It's going to work out what type of field it is based upon 95% of the values within that field. It's going to assume that the field names are in the first row of data. In statistics, field really is referred to as variable. This means column. This means the column itself. So it's the field name, the variable name, same thing. If I click OK here and say no, it reads that, that in. So right away there, you can see that we've got some raw data that's been read in here. And it turns out that this is a very well-known data set that was used in a court case back in the 1980s. And uh, it was used to prove discrimination. Each of these rows represents a different employee within a bank. So when I talked about reading and formatting data, there we've read the data, but we haven't formatted it. And by formatting it, I mean setting it up so that we can get the best out of it from an analysis standpoint. So, for example, here, you can see that the field gender here is quite squeezed together. I mean, changing the format of that just means, would, for example, include me just stretching it out so I can see it. So, you can see also here it's got a little A symbol next to it. That means that this is what's called a character string field because it uses letters and or number, uh, and numbers uh, or just letters. But it's got, it's got alphanumeric characters in it. This one here, for example... It's only made up of numbers, but it's got a little dollar sign in front of it, so it's a dollar format. Here we've got just numbers. Here we have numbers, but it's got a different symbol across the top, indicating it's some sort of category. This is also some sort of category. This is their job category. So the formatting of the field, here we have minority, also set as a category field. It's got this little symbol. So the, the formatting is very important here because it makes it easier for us to uh, do analyses. So, for example, if I wanted to do an analysis on job cut using it as, as it currently appears. One quick and dirty way I can do it is I can just right click on it and say give me very uh, give me descriptive statistics on that and it'll just go and give me some a, a basic count on that and it runs what's called a frequency command and you can see here's the frequency table coming out saying that 76% of people were in category one, 5.7 percent in category two and 17.7 percent category three. But the problem is we don't know what these categories mean. And um, the phrase job cut isn't probably what we want above a table, etc., etc. We probably want something a bit more descriptive. You can see it's talking about um, missing data here. It says there's zero missing data. So these are all what's called uh, uh, dictionary information, a part of the formatting. And to, to play around with the formatting, you can go to the variable view tab down here. The variable view means the field view. And now the fields are down the side rather than across the top, which is what we can see in the data view. So fields are down the side. So if I went to gender here, or let's go to job cut again. This, what we can do is we can say, well, does this really need decimal places? No. Does it really need a width of 19? No, it doesn't. It only needs a width of 1 because there's only three categories in it. We only need one, a space of 1 to represent those three categories. It's a numeric field. We should give it a little label, which just basically says, you know, employment category that the employees work in. So here you can see me adding a label, employment category. And we've also got this opportunity here to add, to add what are called values. These are called value labels. So I can say one means um, clerical. That means they are clerical workers, and I can add that. Two is custodial. Custodial is like um, security guards and cleaners and people look after the building. And three is management. I can add that in. And there are other formatting things that we can add in here than what's called the level of measurement and the role. But if I come back to the data view now, you see that these values have appeared. And what's actually happened is that we've attached value labels, and you can switch them on or off their display. You can switch their display on or off by clicking this little button here. So here you can see it no longer says 3.00. It just says 3.1. And then I turn them on or off. 
we can see the labels are displayed and we can scroll down into it and we can change a value here and say you know we want to change this to custodial or management something like that so now if I right click on it and say okay show me some descriptive statistics it gives me a nicer table with employment category across the top clerical custodial management so you can see how formatting the data is really helping us set it up so that we can get the best out of it from an analytical standpoint. And this is one of the things that we would do in SPSS statistics. And it's one of the things that kind of makes it different from a, uh, a spreadsheet. Whereas in a spreadsheet, you know, you don't tend to have this concept of codes and value labels. We do the same thing here for gender. And here we have string one and uh, length of one. Let me just call this obviously sex off employee. And again, the values here could be F, as we, as you would guess, for female, and M for male. Well, let's, let's, let's look at a situation here where we have uh, an uh, employee, it's employee number 10 here, and we actually don't, we haven't recorded, for whatever reason, we haven't recorded their gender. So what do we do here? Well, if I run an analysis on this and go to script of statistics, it now says there's, there's, there's one blank field in there. So I might say, well, actually, that field should be called X, field X, because we don't know that, that value, that category there, that case should be given the value X. We run that, now we get X appearing as a value 1, one occurrence of that. And really what we want to do is tell it that X means that that uh, value is missing. So again, within SPSS statistics, we have this concept of missing values, and we can say, when you see the value X, treat it as a missing case. Hold on. Uh, sorry, it's the wrong. It's wrong. It's gone into the wrong uh, the wrong field here. I'm looking at employment category. I should be up here. Let's say uh, X. <coughs> now, when I run the analysis. X is put into the missing category and it tells me the missing category. So there's a tiny difference here between the percent which includes missing data and the valid percent which doesn't. <coughs> and again, I might not like just the value X, so I might say I want to give a value. I want to give a little label for the X, so I say unknown. And hit add. And now when I run that, you can see the value unknown appears. Let me go to script of statistics. Now it says unknown one. And the idea is that you can have more than one missing value because it's, you know, you may want to say why the data is missing. You might have unknown, you might have refused, you might have not applicable, you might have a range of values. So it's very common in, in data to have special missing values like minus numbers like minus 99 and minus 98 and minus 97. Very common in surveys to have that. Employment category here is, uh, is shown as a nominal field. You could say it's an ordinal field. An ordinal field means when there's a rank order between the categories. So if you thought that two was higher than one, you could say that was an ordinal field. Ordinal fields tend to be, I'm not going to set it, I'm not going to set that as ordinal, I'm going to set it as nominal, which is unordered fields, uh, or, or unordered categories. Ordinal fields tend to be things like rating scales. So again, setting the data up. So we could do this. You know, we could go through this entire data set now and, and set it up. Wouldn't be very interesting for you. But it turns out that if you've already done this once, you can, of course, just copy and paste the labels from one uh, file to the next. So you could just open up another file and just allow yourself to open up another file and then just literally copy and paste the labels and all this formatting data across. Or alternatively, you could go to the data menu here and click copy data properties and if I copy data properties from an external file I've got a file here called employee just the variables meaning just the fields and the fields have been nicely set up and if I go down through this you can see it matches the uh, source data set that's the that's the field that's the data set I'm pointing to to my currently open data set it's the active data set and it matches them by name so if they've got the same name and the same type and it says I'm going to apply all of these properties I can switch them on or off to my target field and hit finish and it just formats the whole thing for me. So there it is. This data set's been nicely formatted for me to work with. And the output is is independent of the data set. I mean we could keep this output that we could just delete it and start again. So we just, just close it and then start from this point forward and say, okay, now I want to do some sort of analysis at this point. X I didn't have a, a label for, so I'm just going to change that back to F for female. 
I could save it. You can see it's called, it's untitled at this stage, but we'll save it at another point. Okay, so if I want to do some sort of analysis now, what sort of analysis can I do? Well, as you saw, I can right click on these and I can say, okay, give me some descriptive statistics and it goes away and it gives me a little percentage table here. I could, um, I could look at the relationship between gender and job category. So I could say, you know, what proportion. So one way I could do that is to do a really simple table, which is the cross tabs procedure. Cross tabs is, is a term that relates to SPSS, as it turns out. It's, it's the actual command word. Prior to that, they were called contingency tables. I'm going to put um, gender in the columns, and I'm going to put job category in the rows. It doesn't really matter. And I'm going to switch on um, the column percentages. And I'm going to ask for a bar chart at the same time. If I click OK at that point, it goes and creates this little table for me with a bar chart across the top here. So here, have, here we have, you see, 95% of, as it says, percentage within gender, 95% of females are clerical workers. None of them are custodial workers. Only 4.6% are managers compared to 60% of males are clerical workers. 10.5% uh, are custodials and 28% are managers. And this is simply reflected, of course, in our bar chart along the bottom here. If we don't like the appearance of the table, uh, we can activate the table itself. And we can, for example, we can move things around. If we don't like, you know, where where the columns are, we can drop, you know, swap them about and put totals and that sort of stuff and play around with co uh, categories, etc. And, and move them about. It's, uh, I'm not going to change it here, but you know, you get the idea. You can move these things around. Um, alternatively, you can change the aesthetic looks of it by going to the table looks, and you'll find there's a menu of table looks, or you can create your own table look. So you can see there's a nice table look here called blue. You can change that and say that's table look. Or you can set up your own table look. So if you've got a particular house style, maybe it's based upon your own, um, your own corporate colors, for example. You might say, okay, well, I want to change the appearance of these tables and change the colors, etc., within them. And you know, you could change your own font and have background colors in a particular color, uh, or have alternating rows in different colors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and then save that as a default setting by changing what's called the, um, for double click here, changing the, uh, the, uh, um, the table properties, just as you saw me changing looks at the table, table properties here. And I'll say, okay, let's, um, let's have that one there as black, and we'll have the, you know, the font as, as white. And it appears as white, and the same across the top here. Let's go for black, the font is white. And you hit apply. And then you'd save that as your table look, for example. But we'll stick with the default for now. Um, if we go back to the data set, what happens if I wanted to look at the relationship between, let's say, job category and salary? Well, I couldn't use, I couldn't use a, a, uh, a table for that. Because if I try to do a table of salary where I show the percentages, that just doesn't make sense. It would be the equivalent of doing this. It would be like, Picking, asking for a frequency table of salary, and this gives me a very, very long frequency table to tell me what percentage of people fill in each salary value. Alternatively, I can show um, summaries, so I can say, okay, show me the mean salary, the median salary, that makes sense, of course. And I could do a comparison of this broken down by two, broken down by the different, uh, the different groups, the different employment groups, so I could say, compare the means, for example, here and say, let's pick up salary broken giant down by job category and go to options and you could even ask for extra values in here you've got things like number of cases you can move them around you can ask for the minimum and the maximum or the sum so I could say okay let's let's put mean and median and we'll have standard deviation number of cases click continue and okay that gives me a little table to show me the mean clerical salary the median clerical salary the mean custodial the median uh, the, me, the mean manager, managerial salary, the median managerial salary. You can see the differences between them. And you could, in fact, double-click on these values and go down here and say, okay, create a little graph for me, create a little bar chart for you. It would just show you those different median values. Let's see, report current salary median ascending as we go look across the employment categories here. Or alternatively, you know, we could... We could take the uh, field salary here and band it in some way. We could do the same thing if we had a field called age. We don't have a field called age. 
a field called uh, um, a birth date. So let's do let's do salary first, and then we'll look at how we can do birth date. If I go to salary here, we'll say let's create you know salary banded if you like. I'm going to transform. There's a very nice procedure within model that helps us do this. It's called the visual binning procedure. And if I say okay, salary is the one I want, and click continue. What it does is it scans the data for me. This is the salary distribution. This is called the skewed distribution. And I'm going to create a new field and call it sal band. It's offering me the label current salary binned. I don't like binned as a term, so I'll use it grouped. And I can tell it where to effectively slice. If you imagine this is a cake, where to slice the cake by saying make cut points. And I can say, you know, put in three cut points. So it slices it into quarters. And it shows me where it's going to slice it. And if I don't like where it's going to slice it, I can actually move these values up and down. You can see, and it, it takes account of where I'm moving them. Or I can just round this up and say, okay, well, I'm just going to round that up to thirty-seven thousand dollars because that seems to be. Here we've got twenty-eight thousand eight hundred seventy-five. Well, let's just round that up to twenty-nine thousand. And what you'll see is this line shifts ever so slightly. Nine thousand. And then we make the labels, because what it's still going to do is going to create uh, codes one, two, and three. We say make labels, it makes these little labels, and we don't like the labels, we can change that to less than or equal to. And this one here we can say simply over 37,000. So that's 37,001 plus, if you don't like that label. We click OK. It says I'm going to create a field for you. You say OK. And it goes and creates this field for us showing salary band, which is just created in the end. So this is us manipulating the data. And now, of course, we could go to analyze descriptive statistics and use cross tabs in here and look at the um, job category broken down by salary banded. And uh, we could say, yeah, let's, 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 let's change the percentaging here so that percentaging now is row percentages. Click OK. And what we get is this little table. I've still got, I've still got my bar chart switched on. And it says, OK, well, 33% of clerical workers are less than or equal to 24,000. 32% are in this group. 25% are in that group. 9% and 10% are in over 37,000. Compared to the managers who are 98% are on over 37,000. And if you want to make sure that you get a fairly even, what we were trying to do there when we banded it was we were trying to, we are getting at the band and get it to cut it so it give fairly even sized groups for us so that we could share them out appropriately across these other groups within the data set. If you want to check that, of course, you can just go to the script of statistics here and you can see that it's roughly 25%. It's roughly quarters is what it's sliced into. That's one, one of the really useful things about the visual banding procedures that will automatically slice them into quarters. Okay, what about something like age? You know, how can we get age from birth date? Well, it turns out, again, if we go to <clears throat> transform here, we've got a little procedure called date and time wizard. It's a little wizard for dealing with date fields and time fields. And you can see it, it's got various options. What do you want to do? Do you want to learn how they're represented? Do you want to create dates and times from a, a character string? Um, do you want to create a date and time variable from variables holding parts of date and times? Or do you want to calculate with dates and times? Or do you want to extract part of a date and time? Do you just want to pull out the year? But we want to calculate with dates and times. <coughs> and if I hit next at this point, I'm going to calculate the number of time units between two dates. And I'm going to look at the people's birth date and today's date. And uh, I'll get them to tell me what age they are today. If these people were still alive, what age they are today. And if I hit next at that point, I'm going to create a little field called age today. And just give a little label, age of employees. Let me hit finish. <coughs> and here we have the field saying the age of those employees today. So let's run some descriptive statistics and see what the minimum and maximum is in that. Some of these people may not be alive anymore. And we can see that the minimum is 46. Now it's actually about 26 years ago that this was actually, this, this data was collected. So we could simply take 26 away from that age value and create a new field called age of employee or age at the time, you know, something like that. So to do that, I would simply go to transform compute. This is very similar to doing a little formula in Excel. And I'll call it age then. I'll call it age then. 
look at that. And I'll get, again give it a little label. I'll just call it in this case just age of employee. And of course what I do is take age today and then take away 26 years from that. Click OK. And now I get a new field called age then. I don't like the decimal places so I'll get rid of those. I should have got rid of those. Oh. And uh, if I come back here and right click and say variable, inf uh, sorry, descriptive statistics, you can see that the minimum age was 20, um, the oldest person was 62, and that the mean's about 34. And then again, of course, we could take age then, or age today, or age, and we could band it. So we could say, okay, let's go to transform visual binning, and we'll take age then, and hit continue. And this time we'll, we'll We'll splice it into, I'm just going to create a field here called age group. Um, we'll break it into three groups. So if I go to make cut points and say, yeah, give me two cut points. It tells me where it's going to cut it, 27, 37, and above, and I make labels. There we go. We'll just stick with that. We'll click OK. It's going to create a new field for us called age group. And here's age group. And if you hit descriptive statistics, you can see it's, it's tried to slice it into thirds. It can't do it all the time because, you know, you get a lot of cases that are a bunching around about the same age group, but it's 42% are under 27, 26%, 28, 37, and 31, nearly uh, thir nearly 32%, or 38 and over. And now again, we could say, well, is there a relationship between that and the, their salaries, for example? We could go use our earlier procedure, the crossed out procedure, and swap around. So here's a field we're creating, we click OK, and we find out that, you know, 22% of those aged under 27 are less than or equal to 24,000. That 31% uh, of them are 24 to 29,000. 24% 29 to 37,000. And 21% over 37,000. As opposed to the 38 plus, where actually only 12% of the people aged over 38 plus are on 37, over 37,000. And 46% of those aged 28 to 37 are over 37,000. Now, one of the reasons why this is occurring, this seems a bit unusual, is because a lot of the custodial workers and a lot of the older clerical workers, a lot of the clerical workers are, are older, and, uh, and as a result, they don't earn as much as the managers. So um, a lot of the older employees are actually um, in the, in the, in the uh, poorer paid uh, job categories. So that's one of the things that's driving it. So here you can, you can see we've, just within this short period of time, we've created these extra fields which allow us to do more analyses. And if we wanted to see if there was a relationship between these, we could do a, we could do a test. We could say, okay, um, let's find out if there's a relationship between, let's say, uh, pe whether people are, are an ethnic minority under age group. Click OK. And it turns out that, you know, 85% of those aged under uh, 27 are not ethnic minorities, 14% are. Of those aged 28 37, 23% are ethnic minorities, and those aged 38, 31% are ethnic minorities, 38 plus. Um, and if you don't, if you wanted to play around with the statistics there, we could say, okay, well, let's look at the column percentages instead and say of those who are an ethnic minority, we find out that 44% of them are aged 38 and over, 38 and over, whereas of those who are not in ethnic minorities, only 28% are aged 38 and over. And if we want to do a statistical test associated with that, and there are lots of these, we can go to statistics and click on chi-square, which is the test which is most commonly associated with crosstab. And it tells us the probability that what we're looking at here is in fact just a random effect that's saying it's a very small number, that's less than 0 0.05. We normally regard that as statistically significant. If you're not sure what it is you're looking at, you can actually activate these, um, these uh, uh, statistical outputs and look at what's this, and it tells you what it is. It says, it's a statistic used to test the hypothesis that the row and column the variables are independent. That means that they have no relationship. And it gives you a little bit of, you know, a little bit of uh, advice here how to use it. And over here, if we look at these values, it says, okay, this is a significance level based on asymptotic distribution, that means estimated, estimated distribution of a test statistic, typically a value of less than 0 0.05 is considered significant, and this is obviously less than 0 0.05. So we regard this as 
as a significant relationship. Okay, so that's one thing we can do. What about, I said earlier on, you can see we're doing very basic, uh, we're doing very basic sorts of tests here, very basic sorts of analyses. What if we wanted to use a module to change the appearance of the output? Well, one of the first things I'm going to do is change the default appearances. So if I go to edit options here, and if I go to pivot tables, I can change the default payments. So I'm going to say switch to blue and say that's my default now and click OK. And now if I go to analyze, I can use one of my modules. Use the tables module and click on custom tables. And I've got lots of variables to play with now. So I can put age group down the side and I can put uh, gender as a subgroup of that. So I can either add gender on the side here or I can cross tab it by gender, so it basically becomes a little cross tab, or I can have gender as a subgroup within that. And if gender is a subgroup of that, I don't really need the label gender of employee because it's obvious what male and female is. So I can just right click on that and say, you know, don't show me the label. And then I could either put things like uh, minority across the top up here. So I could put minority and have the count. I could go in here and say, okay. And let me change the uh, percentages. Let me change the change this, change these values here, so that they're not counts. They are in fact, you know, the row percent or something like that, or the column percent. So I can say, yes, yeah, give me the column percent. And if I don't like how the column percent appears, let's change the words to column percent. And if I don't like it having decimal places, I can round it up to zero. And hit apply the selection. And then I could throw in things like, you know, um, what about things like salary, well I could throw that in, but if I don't like the mean salary, I could say okay, well I want the median salary. So you can see here that um, I've really got a lot of control over the uh, over over the appearance of this uh, table here, and I could put in education, years of education. If I don't like median years of education, I want mean, I can change that. Put mean in, apply selection, we could minimum, maximum. And here, if I go to totals, categories and totals, I say, yes, show me a total, but don't call it a total, call it a base. And, you know, apply it to, put it above, put it at the, at the top, not at the bottom. So it puts it up here rather than down here. So you've got control over that. And the same over here. I mean, I could say, yeah, I want, I want an overall total there. So I'll just leave that, I'll leave that one as total, just to show that you can have different values for it. And uh, total gets added in here, you can see. So we could click OK. Now we've got much richer table with median and mean values being shown. We've got the base. We've got the count. We could, should, should have changed that to percentages, actually. Change that back to uh, percentages here. So we've got statistics. Change that to uh, column percent. Throw that in. Apply selection. And the column percent and other etc etc so you can see how the tables module allows you to build up much more complex tables so this is this is kind of the approach that we take within within the statistics application here we are we're building up a report we're doing lots of sort of analyses what sorts of things can we do graphically well there's a whole bunch of things we can do graphically I mean for example here if I go to graph board template chooser one of the nice things is is if I click on different charts, it starts to recommend charts to me. So I could say, okay, well, I want I want something like a uh, scatter plot here. I want a scatter plot, but actually what happens if I click on a third field like age, age then. Now it offers me a different type of chart. It says, well, you can have a bubble plot. If I go in here, I can even have it colored by, you know, something like age. Um, and I could have, uh, I could have um, the shape by, you know, two different values, such as whether or not they're male or female. I click OK at that point, and it goes and produces this chart for me, and if I don't like the appearance of it, I can click up in here and go to Edit. Well, I can go in, I can click in here and change the edit, change the, the coordinates of it, so I can go into Edit Mode and say, okay, let's switch on all of these different editing properties, the colors, for example, the lines, the shapes, the font. As I click on these and say, well, I don't really want that as green. I'll have it as red. You can see it's starting to change the colors. And I click on the background here and I make it a nice dark gray. And then the size of the colors are actually going to have a level of transparency associated with it. Where squares are males and uh, 
circles of females, and the larger the squares, the older they are, the larger the circles, the older they are. And obviously, we see a strong relationship here between um, the current salary and the beginning salary. Click close that point. So here we can get these nice sorts of charts coming out. Or alternatively, we can do sort of very standard charts. We've got the graphs up here. We've got the chart builder. And uh, a typical chart I might use is something like a, 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 a what's called an error bar, which allows me to show the relationship between uh, the the means, the averages, broken down by different groups. So I can say, show me uh, age group, across the side here, uh, broken down by whether or not people are a minority, for example. I click OK at that point. And here we have this very interesting little bar chart coming up. This is actually showing me the mean values in here. So this is actually the mean values. So I can double click on this, make these a wee bit stronger. So I can click on these values here and say OK. And change the colors, for example, to the properties here and say, okay, let's have that as dark red, apply. So we can change these values and, you know, we can play around with the appearance of them, etc., etc. Um, and the key here is that we're not just looking at the average, we're looking at what's called the 95% confidence intervals of the average, so I can put in. Let's just put in some uh, you know, major and minor ticks and hit apply here to make it a little bit easier to see. And what we're doing, as I change this in the background, I'll just change the properties while I talk through it. Um, what we're doing is instead of showing the average, as you know, the average is just a, you know, it's just a sort of very basic sort of statistics, just a mean. Um, but the average will change from one sample to the next. So what a 95% confidence intervals try to do is they try to tell us, well, you know, how much should we expect that average to change by? You know, how reliable is it? You know, is it um, is it likely to vary a lot or not? So, here I have these are the confidence intervals, which is showing that you know, for example, age people aged under twenty seven who are in a minority group, we don't know what their true mean salary is, but it's somewhere around about here, and it varies. It varies by that amount. It varies by a relatively small amount. Just just a, for barely a, maybe a couple of thousand dollars, you know, it's probably a thousand dollars. Whereas here, twenty-eight thirty-seven, that mean is less reliable as an estimate. It's more likely to vary, possibly because there's a lot more spread within that group, or possibly because we don't have as many cases to be as literally as confident about these values. If I pick up the little circles here and click click on the little circles, and I can make them bigger, for example, or make them solid. Um, and, and so on and so on, so you get the idea. So yeah, there's lots of different ways in which we can use charts to show us and help us investigate the variation within the data. And then finally, you know, we could, we could, we could possibly just export this output back out into Excel, so we could save this as an Excel file, or we could go to the output here, the actual output window itself and say, go through here and edit the output and say, yeah, I want to keep that one, I want to get rid of this one, I'll give it different titles, et cetera, et cetera. You can tell it what you want to keep. If you don't like anything, just delete it. Or you can simply open up another um, uh, output window and copy and paste the stuff that you want to keep into that output window. You can see here I am using this little navigator on the side here. Every piece of output here has a, has a, uh, um, uh, a little what's called a log file associated with it, and it tells me the command that SPSS is running to do that. And this is very powerful and very useful because if I'm going to run the same analysis, you know, week in, week out, let's say I just do something as simple as a frequency table here, you know, a frequency table on gender. If I click OK at that point, it will run the frequency table, but if I click paste, it shows me the command that's going to run. So if I had a new data set that was run every every month, I could just save the analysis that I did by hitting paste all the time and then just run that analysis and it would just go and create this table for me again. So you can actually save the entire thing as, as basically what's called a batch job and then run the whole thing. And then having done so, you can then export the output itself. So you can go to File, Export. And if you look at the range of different export options you have here, um, you can export as Word, as PowerPoint, as PDF, for example. So you can click all visible or just the selected bit, etc., etc. And uh, click OK here. It's going to go out as a PDF. So 
<coughs> lots of different ways in which we can export the results of this analysis. This is one of the reasons why people use SPSS statistics because you know we're just scratching the surface here. We're doing some very basic analysis. We did a little frequency table there. We did some statistical tests. We used a module. We did some graphical analysis. And very importantly, we've used some nice procedures to manipulate the data. If we wanted to, as I did mention, I'll just show at the end here, if we just wanted to do an analysis, just say on the female employees, um, that would be very simple. We'd go to data up here and go to select cases. And we'd say, select them if gender equals, well, gender equals what? Well, if we look up the code, it tells us it's F for female and M for male. So I'd say, if gender equals, in quotes, F, then select that data set, hit continue, OK. And we can see that all the males have been deselected because of a little stroke through it. So now if I, if I do the job category up here and hit descriptive statistics and job category, you'd see that it only shows two job categories, clerical and managers, because there are no female uh, workers within the custodial category. And there are, in fact, 217 female uh, workers within the entire bank. OK, hopefully that gives you a kind of overview of how to use the software. What else can we say? Well, first of all, you should look on our website, really, if you want to find out more about this. There's lots of other examples and lots of materials on our website about choosing the correct statistical test. We have a resources page here with videos on it. We have a number of blogs. And you can sign up for any other forthcoming events, given that we, we run these events on a fairly regular basis. With regard to working with us, well, we're experts within the IBM SPSS suite software. So that means we're able to sell it directly to you. And we're a smaller company than IBM, so we're generally quite agile and easier to deal with. And as experts, that means we deliver training courses and consulting. Um, if you've already got SPSS, we'll run little sessions to help you get the most out of your SPSS licenses and generally give no strings attached advice. We're a support providing partner. So that means we provide technical support and we can provide it directly to you. And we offer telephone support with error messages and web tickets, but we also offer how-to support, i.e. if there's something you're not sure how to do, uh, we'll try and give you some advice to help you get started on that. In the meantime, I hope you find that useful, and we look forward to logging in again in the near future. Thank you. Bye-bye.